let's take a look at something that's I think taken for granted um, sometimes and, and perhaps not well understood or, or I, th I think it can lead to con confusion and that's the idea of what a scientific model is in fact I mean a model uh, anywhere in life really I mean what, what's a model you know you want to buy um, you know, buy some clothing or something on online. You might uh, you go to the Abercrombie website or something, and you see a picture of someone wearing the clothing, and uh, you know that that kind of gives you a prediction for what that piece of clothing might look like if if you were were wearing it. So so a model there is a way of predicting um, behavior, right? It predicts. Um, some some kind of a result actually yeah let's just call it that we'll call it a result it projects a result and you know a, a child might play with a model car and it you know it, for the child it for the child's purposes it's sufficient it it it, it predicts that uh, the way something rolls on on four wheels and it moves around and it's it's fun and the same way the car could be fun right so we have we have these we have these many many models there. Fashion model, right? There's a fashion model. We got a model car, um, and they they predict behavior or predict results. But of course, they they also have they also have limitations, don't they? They're, they're limited, but that's okay. And and I think that we we understand it instinctively with a fashion model or a model car. Um, but the same thing is really true of of scientific models. Uh, for example. We've we've um, introduced uh, in this in this course the the idea that we can model an atom, you know, the, this kind of base unit of matter. We can model as a as a sphere, and we you know we even tr treated it in face centered cubic by you know, slicing it up. But we were able to get that level of of uh, or get some useful information by by treating an atom as a uh, a sphere. Now, is that a correct depiction of an atom? No, it's it's not. There's there's certainly finer levels to the structure of an atom than just what we get from a sphere. Here's my best attempt at a sphere. That's the catch light there. And I'll shade in the back, the shadows back here. Look at this, gorgeous, gorgeous. Okay, so that's supposed to be a sphere popping right out of the page there for you. So. But it was good, you know. We could actually, in fact, what else could we could we do with this model of the atom as a sphere? Well, we could take we could take two of them and add one extra level and make a slightly new model. That's a spring between them. And what did we get with that model? Well, that model took us to Young's modulus. It was it was a good enough model for that particular discussion. We could even uh, discuss the interatomic force separation curve. Right? And that, that's how we arrived at Young's modulus from the slope of the force separation curve where these atoms, model as little hard spheres, um, were at their equilibrium space. And so that, that took us there. Um, this hard sphere model took us to the idea of a unit cell, which, which enabled us to, uh, to go and calculate density, you know, a, a physical property. So it was a good model. And it, and it, it allowed us to explain a lot. In fact, we even took the, the model of the atom as a sphere and we built on it with this unit cell and then that introduced for us the these imperfections, crystalline imperfections, didn't it? Crystal imperfections. Because we took all these little spheres and we realized that there's there's going to be places where that regular arrangement of spheres in space breaks down and we saw for example the edge dislocation um, and what did that do for us well the edge dislocation right allowed us to explain plastic deformation allowed us to explain plastic deformation that step-by-step -step breaking and reforming of bonds plastic deformation and that understanding led to strengthening of metals, right? All from this simple model of the atom as a sphere. But there's there's limitations to it. Um, you know, we, we can't explain just with this model alone electrical properties, conductivity. It doesn't. We need to get into what, what the electrons are doing. 
um, optical properties. Well, you know, you can't really completely, well, you, you can't get even that, that close to explaining it with just that hard sphere model. You need a more detailed model. So there are limitations to, to models. And uh, with, with polymers, what we'll do is, you know, we'll, we'll treat polymers, these molecules, these great long molecules, as if they're strings. So we'll go and we'll say polymers can be modeled as strings. And that is actually a fairly good description to, to or a model, I mean, for explaining many properties, mechanical properties, some thermal properties, um, uh, dissolution of polymers. But there's, you know, there's going to be limitations as well, particularly when we try to get into um, conductivity and optical properties. So I think it's important to realize that there's there's models, and model only needs to be as as useful or as valid as it needs to be for what you're explaining. <clears throat> So we'll also get into you know these models of the atom, and we'll have certain models of the atom where we have this little nucleus with maybe we have some electrons, um, and nucleus with some electron um, orbiting it, and you'll see you know there'll be this type of de description here is going to be useful, but there's going to be limitations. And, and as, as the learner, I don't want you to get hung up on the fact that there are limitations. In fact, as you learn, what you should sort of keep in mind is that, that it's fine for there to be limitations, but also for you to be um, aware of, of that so that you know when uh, certain, uh, certain models are valid and when they're not. And that's that's absolutely fine. I, I think I, I mean I remember when I was a student, I, I kind of got hung up on, well, why are we going to treat the electron as a particle in any discussion when we only learn later that we got to treat it as a wave, and and it was frustrating because I I, I struggled to think, well, why don't we just you know <laughs> have one model that does everything? And well, unfortunately, we we don't we don't really understand everything at that, that level. And in fact, sometimes a a model is too complicated for the the for your particular need. You know, we can model casting of steel um, with water. So, you, and why is that? Well, because molten steel has a similar viscosity to water, and so you can you can make a, a physical model, a little pilot, or like a, a test uh, facility, and you can pour water through. Uh, parts of that process and, and get a fairly good prediction for what the flow of the molten steel will be like. Does it predict solidification of the steel? Well, no, of course not. But but that's fine because that's not what you're using it for. So th there's many models and there are limitations to each. Uh, you know, in fact, like a mathematical model where we would model, you know, say even individual atoms and their behavior has places where it's applicable and places where it's it's limited. So it's it's important for you to realize that, and and I certainly hope um, that you can be comfortable with that as we dive through different models and different ways of looking at things.